Welcome to the third of a series of the podcast on Sustainable Development Goals, Evaluating Progress for a Brighter Future. This is Qasem El Sadiq. I am the co-chair of Eval SDGs Network, the global network of evaluation practitioners around the globe. We've discussed so far adaptive evaluation uh, when considering global climate risks. And in the second episode, we covered how to get started in designing, scoping, and defining the SDGs evaluation. In today's session, we will be exploring with our guest the use of the country-led evaluation of the SDGs. And with that, I'd like to introduce and to welcome three of my guests for today, Dorothy Lux, Anna de Oliveira, and Petri Osikila. Dorothy? Yes, uh, hello to you all. My uh, name is Dorothy Lux. I'm the Executive Director of SDF Global. That stands for Sustainable Development Facilitation. I'm a credentialed evaluator and we operate a social enterprise that works not only in evaluation, but also in a whole range of other sustainable development support processes. And good to mention that Dorothy uh, was the former co-chair and one of the founders of Eval SDGs Network. Welcome, Dorothy. My second guest is Anna de Oliveira. Anna? Hello, everyone. So, Anna de Oliveira, I am the Policy and Research Officer at Cooperation Canada, which is a Canadian network focusing on international cooperation. So I lead the files around the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs within the organization. And for two years, in partnership with 12 other global organizations, I coordinated an independent civil society-led report on the progress of national SDGs implementation. Welcome, Anna. My third guest is Petri Usikila. Petri? Oh, hello. My name is uh, Petri Usikila. I'm a managing director of uh, Frisket and Joy, a uh, research company doing evaluations. But I also I have a position at the University of Vasa. I'm a research director in a research platform called the Complexity Research. And that is a systems uh, approach to, to uh, more complicated and complex societal issues. Um, but I've just started an evaluation of the, of the uh, national um, SDG goals in, in Finland. That is a national evaluation so I'm willing to share also some of the ideas that we have in mind doing the national evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, Petri and Anna and Dorothy. And I think, Petri, you've laid the ground for um, probably the first set of questions and um, kicking the dialogue. And basically, I'd like to start with you so we're, we're clear and we have some clarity um, on what is a country-led evaluation since you have just embarking into it. Um, what is country-led evaluation? Uh, why is it conducted and how is it done? That is a, an important question since uh, Finland has been very active in, in evaluating the national implementation of the SDG goals. We uh, carried out the national evaluation in 2019 and that was an excellent evaluation. It gave uh, a very good uh, state-of-the-art analysis where we were at that time. And also, I was very happy to see that uh, quite a few of those recommendations in that evaluation, you could see in our government, the forthcoming uh, government program and its uh, implementation uh, guidelines. So it's really fed to the political process as well. And then Finland has also uh, carried out so-called the voluntary national reviews, and the latest one was in 2020. And that's uh, also an excellent re report. And uh, there was a, uh, Switzerland and, and Mozambique that gave the peer review comments to that report. And it's an excellent piece of work also. But why Finland is doing another evaluation at this, this time, uh, I'm not fully aware of all the motivations behind it, but I think one of the reasons is that SDG goals have been very uh, high in our government agenda. And also uh, quite a few of our ministries want to see the continuation since we have a government election coming in next spring. And that is a way to give the, the state of the art uh, analysis and, and, and results prior 
to to government program preparation so i think that's one of the key reasons and the main emphasis in in our evaluation is the 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 implementation the the, the governance and the mainstreaming issues from the governance perspective. That's one of the main main uh, topic. Thank you, Petri. I think uh, so mainstreaming issues, governance issues that seems to be carried over from one evaluation to the other within the context of the agenda. Uh, Dorothy, what if it's not a full-fledged uh, uh, evaluation of the SDGs? Uh, what if uh, what if it's only contribution to the evaluation of the SDGs? I mean, from your perspective, what can it bring to the uh, to the picture, and what role the different stakeholders uh, would would be contributing to? Yes, thank you, Kasem. Um, there's no doubt that Finland has been a world leader with regard to evaluation of the SDGs, and Petri, we we watch Finland with great interest on how. Um, a more systematic approach across the SDGs is actually carried out. But most countries find um, that difficult to achieve, um, that very often the issues that they're facing are very broad and vast, and therefore the resources to uh, lead a full-scale uh, evaluation of the SDGs at the national level is beyond their reach at this stage. But what has been happening is where there's a lot of um, focus on partnership evaluations. So they may not be fully country initiated and led, but there is strong partnership on um, a particular SDGs. If we take the example of Nigeria, where they went through a process of prioritizing which SDGs they would focus on, or in other countries where there's been a focus on SDG 2, um, SDG 1, that particular um, organizations have worked with national agencies to and other stakeholders to focus on particular SDGs and accelerate and deepen understanding of progress around those. And a, a contribution is still progress um, and better than nothing at all. And there are useful lessons coming out of these. So the principles um, embodied in what Finland are doing, um, even if they can't be fully replicated, there's a lot that still can be done to push forward on country-led evaluations related to the SDGs. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So in a sense, a country-led evaluation, while it has a premise that revolves around um, uh, national ownership, uh, whenever capacity and resources are not there, uh, we call upon our partners and we, we capitalize on the partnerships to get it, uh, to get it running, to get it done. Um, I mean... From there, I'd like to pick up on uh, on the on that discussion with Anna and see and explore with her um, um, that although it happens at the at the country level, um, but some of the results of those uh, evaluations of the SDGs are picked up also and used at different levels at various level. Um, from your experience, Anna, I mean, what other levels uh, do these country-led evaluations, or are they are they used there? Sure. So uh, these evaluations, they can be used at the global level. So, for example, to measure progress strategically across all countries, as well as national and subnational levels. So um, these evaluations at the country level, um, and particularly the voluntary national reviews or the VNRs, as we call them, they bring contributions in different areas. So, for example, they outline which governance arrangements exist, which institutional mechanisms are in place to realize the agenda and the SDGs, uh, which policies are being implemented, how multiple stakeholders and this uh, including non-state actors are being engaged, or how the country is pursuing partnerships. So all these elements can contribute to global level conversations. And uh, picking up on what Dorothy just said about uh, partnership evaluation, there is an interesting example from the 2021 VNR reports that relate to coordination and partnership in reporting. So there was a coordinated effort between six small island developing states, or the SIDS as we call them, 
in which they collectively highlighted common vulnerabilities, challenges, and strategies, which could then uh, be turned into shared solutions and new common opportunities to contribute to sustainable development initiatives through inter- and intra-regional cooperation. So all these would fit into um, another level of conversations in the regional and in the global spheres. Of course, the candidate evaluation and uh, the VNRs, the relationship between them is more or less complementary. In a sense that VNRs might feed into the candidate evaluations and vice versa. Probably I want to catch up with Dorothy on the use of those uh, candidate evaluations and VNRs globally, both in terms of accountability and in terms of learning. From your perspective, what lessons have we learned so far after seven years of engaging on the Agenda 2030 with whatever we have in terms of evaluation and VNRs? Our positive lessons and negative lessons, I think, uh, that what we've learned over the last years of implementation, that there's no doubt that there has been increase in what we call meta-evaluations, where there's an approach, particularly by some of the development partners, to look across different countries and look at the emerging lessons related to the SDGs or around particular themes which are important across the SDGs. So say, for instance, uh, meta-evaluations on capacity development or on learning methods of learning. So these meta-evaluations contribute very much to the development body of knowledge, and these are used by development partners. We know not only in within uh, specific development partners, but there is quite a lot of collaboration across different networks, like the UN Evaluation Group, like Eval Partners. So those global platforms allow for sharing of information. Similarly, the VNRs that UNDESA does generate a synthesis across the VNRs. And this is is a very useful resource to look at what aspects are moving well and which need further focus. But at the same time, there are some lessons and challenge around the challenges with that. One is that there are insufficient evaluations actually being carried out, that there has been a strong push to develop national evaluation systems, but perhaps with limited success or very varied success. This means that the number of evaluations being generated are below what might be possible, uh, below potential. Also, there's not a, always a systematic approach to looking at country-led evaluations, not just those related to a particular organization. Uh, thank you, Dorothy. I think that you've raised a couple of very interesting points that would probably we can carry it with Petri. Um, how... Um, how the uh, the evaluation in Finland uh, potentially is informing policy um, development at the national level. If you give us some examples, probably to um, uh, to pick up and then share the learnings with others. There are actually two very important platforms in in Finland. One being the Strategic Research Council under the Academy of Finland, that is uh, more um, let's say. Uh, uh, research oriented but also has a certain evaluative uh, missions uh, included and that is uh, to the the strategic research council aims to identify the critical uh, phenomena uh, at at a very uh, broad level and that also also links to the sdg goals and targets there, there are big research programs that also contain elements of evaluation. So that's a long-term strategic research and evaluation. And then there is a new instrument called the DNTS, which is uh, the new funding instrument uh, located under prime minister's office. And that's an annual, uh, uh, they, they carry out several annual evaluations uh, that are targeted to, to critical 
uh, phenomena related directly to the government program and its implementation. So when the, the finance comes from the prime minister's office, then also it's easier to, to feed the, the results and recommendations back to to, to policy process because it's uh, located at, at the high level of government. So that's one of the reasons. And the second is also that, that the various ministries are very keen on on uh, financing their own evaluations somehow related to the various uh, goals and, and targets of the SDGs. So that also feeds to the to the sectoral processes at, at the ministry level. So I would say these three are important platforms for doing evaluations. If you allow me on uh, picking up on this, um, I mean, obviously it seems that uh, there is a systematic approach in, in conducting the evaluation in Finland. And, and uh, there is a more of a, uh, a well-crafted process that feed into the policy making and the development agenda. Uh, how inclusive uh, are uh, those evaluations? What about the current one? How inclusive it is? Um, and what, what, what type of stakeholders and partners are, they, are engaged? Uh, well, I, I, I have to say that, you know, the, the, the VNR in, in 2020 was extremely uh, inclusive. And when we started our evaluation mission, we went through the VNR and its main recommendations. I was very happy to, to realize that the involvement of civil society organizations, various NGOs, but also the, the enterprises and the business community uh, was, was included. And the way how they included those uh, stakeholders was a kind of a applying a I would call it the, the contribution approach and, and uh, NGOs and, and companies reported how they have contributed to, to, to the certain uh, goals and targets of the Agenda 2030. And that's, I think it's a, it's a very uh, important uh, approach. What we are doing, we also, also uh, want to involve various stakeholders and, and societal groups in our evaluation. Some of the the, the issues that we are evaluating are, are more administrative, let's say, the, how the S, S, SDGs have been combined with the, with the let's say, uh, uh, performance budgeting or performance management processes. Of course, that's uh, the ad, administrative uh, issue. Uh, but in other areas, we also carry out uh, several interviews and we organize a number of uh, stakeholder work groups where we want to hear the opinions of various parties. So. It's, it's included. Thank you so much. Brilliant. I mean, if I can turn the, uh, the, the discussion a bit in, at, the, at the subnational level and with other um, subnational and national stakeholders. So, Anna, building on what Dorothy uh, brought up in terms of the global um, uh, uh, scene and uh, capitalizing on what uh, Petri uh, just said in terms of the use at the national level level what about the subnational ones and subnational actors um, what can you bring to the uh, to the discussion yeah for sure so i guess we should first uh, recognize that there should be an understanding that all the different levels say the local the regional the national and the global they are all intertwined and so overlooking the local realities would ultimately mean losing important perspectives, experiences, and uh, drivers of local action to achieve the SDGs. So, uh, and as an example, there are colleagues at the United Cities and Local Governments, which is uh, an umbrella organization focusing on, on the local level. They have been analyzing and reporting on local efforts, um, meaning efforts driven by cities and by territories. To achieve the SDGs, they have been doing this for years now, and a lot of learning comes from subnational and local processes. And as you've mentioned, Kassan, uh, we see that more countries are mentioning the voluntary local reviews in their national uh, reviews. So they're mentioning the LRs in the VNR reports. So this is a very positive trend. Uh, it directly relates to SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. But this is also positive in, in the sense that the VLRs work as an instrument of local efforts. 
And as such, they paved the way for um, subnational accountability structures. Some examples from 2021 VNRs uh, include Colombia, that published a guide to voluntary local reports for the cities and municipalities of Colombia. Another example is Japan, that uh, established a VLR lab, uh, which is a platform that collects worldwide uh, information on VLRs. So for sure, this topic is really picking up momentum in several places in the world. Thank you, Anna. I think you've uh, you've raised a couple of uh, interesting examples of um, uh, local and subnational initiatives feeding into um, uh, country-led evaluation of the SDGs. It would be wise to a bit reflect on the main big lessons uh, at the different levels. So probably if we can pick up on a couple of uh, uh, lessons from the global uh, level, Dorothy, if you started there, and then rolling it out at the national and subnational with uh, both um, Petri and Anna. Uh, yes, indeed. And I think the, the, the role of the development partners um, particularly when they work together, can be very powerful um, because there is a level of resource there, which if it's combined with a country-led approach, that actually helps to move a common agenda forward. So if we take a a few examples, for instance, of the um, Asian Development Bank, that's just completed uh, an evaluation of its approach to climate change. This was a very large evaluation that engaged a number of different countries um, and particularly the Pacific region as a region and looked at countries there which are really heavily impacted by climate change. So in relation to SDG 13, um, even though the evaluation was... Uh, really looking at the Asian Development Bank's approach, it brought together a whole range of different countries to talk about and reflect on their own progress. So there was um, bringing together country evaluations that had been done, project evaluations, all looking at this approach to climate change. One important lesson from that was that the decision makers in the Asian Development Bank and in countries were engaged right at the start of that evaluation to really look at the key evaluation questions that uh, wanted to be answered to then feed into decision making. And that has been successful in the uh, ADB has now intensified its approach and is working at across different countries to work with them on a range of priorities. The other um, good example here is the MOPAN network, which brings together a whole range of bilateral um, development partners who contribute to a central fund to do evaluations, not just of um, their assessments really of development partners, but they also bring out some of the themes that Anna was talking about But I want to raise one other point that isn't always considered at the moment, and that's of the the need to involve national evaluators. Um, So people from the particular country of focus, um, and even sometimes subnational if there are different languages, if there are indigenous peoples, for instance, within a country or not even within one country, but across countries, um, that those kind of approaches haven't necessarily been picked up enough yet in that link between uh, national evaluations, global evaluations and subnational or thematic evaluations. Um, the, The Um, integration of language and culture so that the findings of evaluations can be contextualized to the people that really need the lessons arising from these evaluations.
Brilliant, brilliant ideas, Dorothy. I think you've brought into the picture a couple of very interesting uh, aspects revolving around peer learning among countries with, with, within a collective evaluation, engaging decision makers early in the process and even designing and scoping it, um, uh, doing uh, some uh, evaluations, uh, th more thematic evaluation, and most importantly, uh, this aspect of localizing the evaluation and on that point, probably, I'll pick up on, on Anna, uh, given uh, bringing the voice of uh, the CSOs, uh, both in the VNRs and the evaluations, what can you um, share with us, uh, probably picking up on the localization of the, of the evaluations in such a context? There are many lessons learned in this sense, uh, as well as uh, recommendations. So... I could probably extensively list uh, recommendations around uh, each one of the several topics related to, to SDGs implementation and evaluation. And what uh, Dorothy has just said is tremendously important. And um, so a key takeaway uh, would be in the sense of the need of working together with uh, non-state actors. So what you've mentioned, Hassan, of including CSOs, but also being mindful of uh, indigenous groups or those groups who are um, in many different cases overlooked by, by governments at different levels. So uh, I would say that there are many uh, actors, civil society organizations and other experts as well, uh, like uh, academics, that uh, have been collecting data, have been producing their own evaluation processes and presenting very comprehensive reports that highly contribute to country level and global level review processes. So with this, uh, collaborating with uh, civil society and, and other groups and advocating for their reports to be acknowledged and given status in the high-level political forum, for example, would be important in terms of, one, uh, participation and partnership coordination, also in terms of transparency in reporting processes, and third, also in terms of ensuring accountability for progress of the 2030 Agenda and SDGs uh, implementation and evaluation. Thanks, Anna. I think you've shed some light on um, uh, aspects that uh, are critical to both the uh, VNR process and the uh, country evaluations. And we know that evaluations obviously don't happen in vacuum. There are politics, definitely, but most importantly also there are uh, risks, being them the national, subnational, as well as global level. And if I can turn uh, to Petri with a bit of uh, a reflection on how does this current uh, council rate evaluation in Finland is integrating or accounting for those potential risks. Can you shed a bit of light on, on those aspects, Petri? Going to the risks and, and you know, the f future challenges, I think our uh, National Commission on, on uh, Sustainable Development is doing a, an excellent job in coordinating all the activities. But of course, these are very, you know, uh, complicated and, and complex issues where you face immediately the question of, uh, you know, the systemic impact of, on, of, on certain things. And that is something that goes beyond you know, traditional policy coherence thinking, because there, if you really want to understand the, the systems change in the, in the, in the field of, of uh, Agenda 2030 or SDGs, you also have to see more strongly how these uh, various goals and targets, you know, uh, are interconnected, how they influence one another. And you cannot do it if you tackle them separately. And now what we have we have been doing an excellent job in dealing with these issues separately. And we have very active ministries who have done a wonderful job. But when it comes to, to interdependencies and, and systems change and systemic approach, there we have still uh, uh, much to do. I think I have to mention that the, the uh, SDG uh, evaluations as a whole have, you know, uh, created much closer cooperation between ministries. Uh, especially the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and other line ministries, because the Ministry for Foreign Affairs has a very strong evaluation uh, unit. 
and now the SDGs are, are, are connecting the various line ministry, like the, the Ministry of the Environment, the Ministry of um, Employment and Economy, and so on and so on, uh, together with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, which also gives a more global uh, approach to our national implementation. I think it's a it's a good thing, whether it's a intended or unintended, it doesn't matter. But it you know has a it, it can be seen as a, as a positive outcome of a process. Indeed, uh, often unintended consequences or outcomes um, uh, turns out to have uh, much more impact on the on the change that we all aspire for. Um, probably um, on the on that point, on the points of uh, risks and and, uh, and the era we're living in, we've all noticed that there has been um, a slowdown uh, uh, in terms of the progress on the Agenda 2030. Uh, and I'm afraid uh, that uh, this slowdown basically is affecting also um, uh, the uptake and the scale up of uh, evaluations of the Agenda 2030. Quick remarks, probably, or quick reflections, Dorothy, if you can, if you if you can shed some lights here. In terms of the slowdown of the 2030 Agenda, this indeed is a, a big issue, and one that evaluation as a sector needs to consider and and move towards. Um, evaluations take too long to organize and present at the moment, but there are ways around that. That uh, Most evaluations that we're doing at the moment have some element of consideration of this slowdown. They have some consideration of the impact of COVID. So these, um, what we need is more dynamic evaluations which cut across and draw out some of these risks and the responses so that the learnings can be generated quickly and fed back into um, programming. Of course, thank you so much. I mean, that's critically important, um, uh, bringing the aspect of dynamic evaluation. I think we're we're coming to an end now, and we want to probably conclude our podcast. Can I ask you please to um, uh, formulate and give us at least one thought uh, for our audience on the value of those countrylet evaluations um, to inform the stakeholders about the uh, progress on the agenda 2030? One key takeaway message from each one of you before we conclude. Let's start with Anna, and then Petri, and then Dorothy. Uh, I just wanted to quickly circle back to what you have said in terms of uh, challenges. And you mentioned a couple of them beginning with C, like COVID-19, climate change, uh, conflicts. And I just wanted to add another one, which is uh, civic space and how it has been shrinking in many parts of the world, particularly after the pandemic and and how many countries started using the pandemic as an excuse to further close civic space. So um, it would be worth checking uh, a document from the OECD DAC, which is the Development Assistance Committee, uh, a document they launched in July last year, which is the committee's recommendation on enabling civil society. And so this is a common standard for official actors to address civic space and work with civil society towards the 2030 agenda. So a key recommendation in this sense would really be for countries to not only adhere to the recommendation, but also embed it into their practices. And one big concern um, is that a worrying number of countries is falling short in achieving the global commitments and even to adhering to the UN Secretary General's guidelines for evaluation and reporting. So we, st- we have eight year- years left until 2030. So governments and stakeholders from the global community, they should redouble their efforts to address gaps and work towards achieving the SDGs. So I would leave as a final note that uh, there is opportunity for this to further strengthen evaluation and reporting. And the way of doing that is making use of comparative analysis from using data from other reports, including civil society reports and uh, including peer countries 
report. So keeping the dialogue open is uh, a major key takeaway. Brilliant, brilliant idea. Patrick? I think it's uh, extremely important to, to, to carry out uh, country-led evaluations, the national evaluations, because what we really need is evidence for our policy making. And I'm not referring to a very you know, narrow evidence-based policy making, but the, the, I'm referring to the more uh, evidence-informed policy making where evaluation is an extremely important tool for, for giving decision makers uh, updated uh, information where we are in the certain fields of uh, uh, Agenda 2030. That's the, the fir first thing. But second thing is that the evaluations, if they are carried out in the open and participatory uh, uh, way, they are also excellent tools for involving uh, new groups and, and stakeholders in the process. And we, we saw that in, in our previous national evaluation carried out in 2019. And one of the key factors was, was also the, the uh, participatory approach uh, applied in that evaluation. So I, I think that's a, a very important issue. And maybe the, the third one is that uh, when you carry out national evaluation evaluations, I think it's in, important to apply somehow the developmental evaluation approach, meaning that you are not only collecting data and then reporting at the end of the process, but it's a dialogue also between the commissioner of the evaluation and the evaluation team and the stakeholders. So you, you, you feed the process while you are doing the evaluation. I think that's the lesson learned from Finland. Thank you so much, Petri. I think uh, you've you've shed the light on very important aspect, uh, of course. Dorothy, I think um, if you can conclude with one or two uh, takeaways that you'd like to highlight. Yes, I, I'd like to build on what Petri uh, mentioned there about the importance of inclusion and participation. That if we're talking about country-led, who's actually doing the leading? Um, is Are we talking about country leaders? Are we talking about um, only one sector? I think we're not. We're actually talking about a broad-based country-led approach where there is a reflection of the diversity in that particular country or even in that subnational area. So while um, country-led evaluations of the SDGs are uh, very large and difficult to achieve. There are digestible chunks that we can move on with very quickly, which is the value of country-led inclusion in evaluations for the SDGs so that we can have something that's very manageable of changing the way we do practice of any evaluation to make sure that we are touching base with the key sectors of society within that country, those who are impacted by evaluations, making sure that they are contributing to the evaluations in a way that brings value and brings learning on progress for the SDGs and it identifies innovations and accelerates progress. Thank you. Brilliant ideas. I would like to thank you so much for your uh, deep reflections and your uh, takeaway messages. And I want to, uh, before saying goodbye to our audience, I'd like to call upon them to uh, sign up for the links and sign up for uh, the uh, different episodes to, uh, that we've, uh, we've created under this, this series. And to uh, also uh, announce that this network and other partners, including EVAL partners, are moving towards an initiative to reinstate uh, government commitments to the um, evaluation of the Agenda 2030 under a new resolution that promotes counter-led evaluation and discussion is, is still there. And I believe what we've covered so far feeds and co uh, comes timely into uh, that uh, dialogue and that, uh, those efforts. So thank you so much. And um, a final call for our audience um, to read, check and visit the websites of IAED, uh, DIVAL and EVAL SDGs and other uh, social media platform and share widely those uh, episodes. Um, and hopefully we can talk and we can initiate new dialogues on new issues around evaluation of the Agenda 2030. 
Thank you and goodbye.